phase of Rachmaninoff's Prelude in A Major, number 9, from the Opus 32 Preludes. Rachmaninoff wrote all 13 of these preludes from this cycle in the summer of 1910. And he was in his full bloom as a composer at this point. He was 38, and he had already written his famous third piano concerto. This is a very unusual prelude, and I think it's, it's fairly misunderstood or not understood as far as how it's put together. In the key of A major, your tonality, Rachmaninoff has chosen to highlight that scale with the bass, and it's in 9-8 time. I'm going to play for you now just the bass, and listen as we start on the tonic, the A. It's fairly low on the piano. degrees, but it's the counting, the rhythm, that makes this interesting and challenging. So I can't stress the importance enough of counting, especially 9-8 time. This is a compound meter of 3-3-3. Three, three, three. And the distribution of those three pulses, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then the writing against those, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, is going to play into this piece a lot. So let's count the bass out loud with these nine beats and listen to the complexity of this line. Four measures in length. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Measure 2. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. One, two, three, four. those beats as well as the notes themselves. Now the other two parts are equally beautiful and interesting. The soprano actually sets the template for the motive, the harmonic motive of the piece. Isn't that beautiful? That falling sixth with our A major triad, those are really the third and fifth scale degrees. Three, five, one. And against the bass, we have all three notes of the A major triad, but how different it sounds when it's spread out this far. And that's one of the characteristics of Rachmaninoff, is taking a traditional harmony and spreading it out so we get this amazing expansiveness. So that falling sixth starts on the sixth beat. So I'm going to play the soprano and the bass together now and listen to the counts and also that he's using the A major scale note outline. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. tiny slurs of 16th note groupings, again on, on the offbeat. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Complicated. And if I put all three of those together, then you see the tapestry and the beauty of how he's taking three distinct parts and blending them together 
into a completely cohesive statement of an ascending line. Let's see how it sounds with everybody speaking at once as it's written. And before I start, I always take a breath and I hear the motive, I hear the quality of the tone I want to produce, I hear the quality of that falling sixth. You really need to hear all of this in your mind first before you can project it. And of course the pulse. takes exactly the template of the opening four measures and repeats it again on a new key area, the subdominant, D major. And that sounds like this. This is system two. it would be and that's exactly what it is F sharp minor and this is a good time for me to show you what I'm looking at here this is the first of four pages of the chart which I re-engraved you won't find the piece looking this way anywhere else in the world it's never been done this way before I re-engraved the piece exactly the same notes as you'll find in any other edition, but I put it on a different axis, the 11 inch by 17 inch wide format. And this is a standard size which you can print out easily, and I like to use the cardstock because it stands up nicely on the music rack. But take a look at this incredible opening four measures in the home key of A, and then the very next system, here's system one, system two, and system three. You can see bar lines line up, and our system two is pretty much identical material as system one. It's just in the subdominant D. Four measures, four measures, and as we just saw, I ended here on the F sharp minor, which is the relative minor of A major. And instead of an ascending phrase again, now it's going to be a descending phrase. Six measures in length. It's absolutely beautiful. And you can get this as a digital download from my website, sallychristianmusic.com. You'll find it extremely helpful in learning the piece. You also get in your chart package the satellite view. I'm just going to show you this now because you can see the logic and the mind of Rachmaninoff, and what I just played was the opening four measures and four measures. I put it in the paint box, it's opening material, pretty much the same, and then we're going to take a look now at the first descending six measure phrase. That is your page one. Here's your page two, page three, and page four, the entire piece beautifully laid out for you. And this is a wonderful study guide. This is actually printed on the 8.5x11 from my home printer. It's extremely powerful. I can't wait to get into this with you. So now, we're starting our third system with this beautiful descending six-measure line. And again, I'm going to start with the bass. The bass, if you noticed, has a particular rhythm of long, short, long. 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And that is the rhythmic motive that he's going to use throughout the piece. That and the falling sixth with the harmonic motive, he's going to construct the whole piece around that. So here we are with the bass, beginning of measure nine, system three. F sharp minor. first two systems are going to be around the dominant. But before we get there, we have two more voices to look at. <clears throat> On measure nine here, the soprano now blooms into a duet. Two voices, soprano A and soprano B, one and two, as a duet in thirds. Notice the sixth. bringing us down. It is a sequence. Playing the same material, just stepwise lower. In this case, down by thirds. If I take the soprano and the bass together, is another one of these expanded chords. And it's absolutely beautiful because it shoots off into the soprano duet in thirds. Listen to this beautiful, it's rhapsodic writing at this point. And it's so much fun to play, how it, 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 it's, it's voluptuous and opens you. All of this is Rachmaninoff with his fabulous big hands. You know, he was one of the rare musicians who was at master level as a composer, conductor, and pianist. And the literature that he left for us is amongst the most profound and gorgeous of anything ever written for solo classical piano. It's a pleasure to play. It's worth all of the work. So let's put the hands together now, the last system of page one, and listen to this long six measure modulatory descent into the dominant. Breathe. package. Your version in the working four page copy comes like this, black and white, with much open space. This is such a plus in music. This is such dense writing, thousands of notes. To be able to have some clear space around all of this for writing is extremely helpful and it's also restful on the eyes so it's not so overwhelming. Learning this music can be a very daunting experience because of all the notes, the density of it. This is dense also, but not quite as dense. So starting here now at the page two, Rachmaninoff is doing something 
absolutely wonderful. He's giving us a pedal point on the E, the dominant. Listen now, I'm going to play the left hand, the bass, and at this point in the piece, he's expanding into four-part harmony, but giving more textures and more voices. This is, to my ears, becoming orchestral. And I do hear it orchestrally. I even have instruments in mind for some of the voices, which we'll get into in just a minute. I'd like to play this bass with the left hand and the tenor with the right. In one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Listen to this magnificent. alto with the mm, one, two, three, four, five, six, as a texture uh, counter rhythm. Now we're getting a counter rhythm of quintuplets. So this is the left hand as written. Starting at the top, I'm going to show you my working copy on page two. I just played the left hand alone on systems one, two, and three to show you that that part by itself is almost a standalone part. You could almost get the whole picture of the piece by those two voices, the bass and the tenor. That's how I hear it. And I think when Rachmaninoff wrote for orchestra and he assigned uh, a woodwind section or a brass section. He had these things in mind as well, and that is in this music. You always want to be thinking he knew all these different colors and voices, and it's all in his piano music. So now we have to look at the right hand, the soprano and the alto. And I'm going to play the soprano. Oh, this is so beautiful. Remember I said it's blooming, four-part harmony? The chords themselves are blooming. They're getting richer. Four notes in this chord. Absolutely gorgeous chord harmonies. So how do you play that? I have a secret. It's one of my most favorite tools for playing a chord that I can't reach. And it's hooking the thumb, turning it into a little spatula, and I can get two notes at once. I can get these two, C sharp and D, by just turning my thumb like that. And I'm gonna call out all the times in the music that I do that, and I actually have fingerings in this, and it's written as, Five, four, one, one, and the one, one has a bracket, and that means 
the bracket actually represents the little spatula of the thumb horizontally like that. Let me show you all the times that I do that. And that allows us to get these luscious, just unbelievably beautiful chords. Here. before because it's changing that's a different color than this different mood remember we're climbing here's another one Final fourth part has our one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. These are little waves, and they're even marked with little slurs. There's a gorgeous counter melody here, counter texture, counter rhythm against the quintuplets of the bass. This is extraordinary writing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Isn't that gorgeous? Just that in itself is so beautiful. And then if I put everything together, these four measure ascending phrases, it's just like what he did on page one. So back to our satellite view, we're here now. And I put this in the blue box and I call it section B and it's based on the dominant E major with an E pedal point in the bass. Every single one of these measures is reiterating that E on the downbeat. It's like he's rooted on this E in the bass. And it sets up the power. Where is he going? Why is he doing this? Let's put the parts together and see how this all works. This is measure 15, top of page 2. Start really helps. You can place it better that way. System two. falling sixth and down a third is there. The soprano and the alto listen to this beautiful combined uh, oh, the parts of this alto. It's again just really going to take a lot of separate study. You don't want to miss one of these notes. Rachmaninoff has carefully chosen this counterpoint for the alto. All the way through the piece, the counterpoint is just as important as the basic outline notes that you might sing. Listen to this alto. Oh, this is so beautiful. 
I don't know what that instrument would be. And then what I also want to play here is the soprano and the tenor because that's that's also building the one two constantly moving it's like a dance there's so much life with the different rhythmic fragments that he's using here the bass is my favorite part this is what gives it the massive monolithic quality having the one two three four five six seven eight nine one and of course he's building in a sixth listen to this which would be 9 beats and 9 beats, 18, and he is making what's called a hemiola. He's taking the same 18 beats, but putting it in groups of 6, 6, and 6. Brahms did that all the time. That's, he was one of the first people to really popular, popularize that idea. But here it is. If I count into groups of 6 in the right hand, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Listen to this alto part. I find this just miraculous. I worked a long time on these hidden parts. See, they're all in groups of six. And they're all a little different. You have to know that like it was the central motive of the piece. Every one of these things, this is a lot like Bach. You take each one of these voices, analyze it, Play it alone. Play the soprano and the tenor together. Play the bass and the tenor. Play the alto and the bass. Every combination you can think of. And then you'll start to understand and be able to shape. This is all about delivering an ultimately profound version of the piece based on your knowledge, based on having worked with your own inquiry. What sounds beautiful to me? Where is this taking me? And it changes. Some days I hear other parts and want to bring out something else, and that's the beauty of it. It's like a living art form. It's never the same twice. If it is, uh, that's probably not a good idea. So let's put the hands together. The last two measures of page two, we're modulating. Actually, I'm gonna take the bass alone here because he's building in something. Listen to this, see if you can hear what he's got in here. Well, those are the notes of the A melodic minor scale. He's giving a clue, saying, well, I'm taking you to A minor. Here it is, as written. Listen again as I play. That remember that rhythmic motive is all the way through the piece. Oh, so beautiful. He's taking what we know is this, and he's going. Parallel A minor. And the 
this is what we have. began and he's taking identically in the parallel minor how different it sounds with all white keys A minor has no sharps or flats already it's sad play it slowly listen to that That's amazing, isn't it? Do you know one of the things that influenced Rachmaninoff? When he was 10, and uh, his family lived in St. Petersburg, his maternal grandmother would take him to church, the, the Russian Orthodox Church, all the time. She would, wanted to have a, a spiritual influence on his life. So he was exposed to a lot of liturgy, chants, and above all, the bells, the bells of St. Petersburg, all the cathedrals and churches. And that stuck with him as a ten-year-old boy. That idea of the chants, which I hear a little bit of chant, openness here, almost modal. And the bells profoundly influenced him. And that is where this entire piece is leading, to bells. So what we have now our, I'll show you the music here. I love this part of the piece. To me, this goes way off into a whole remote landscape, and I mean an emotional landscape. This is dark, this is a little austere, it's a little lonely. It almost sounds submerged. It sounds almost underwater, not too real. And that's how I like to play the bass. These one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight measures on page three are one idea, one uninterrupted idea of two measure phrase, two measure phrase, two measure phrase, two measure phrase, and they all have the same idea going on. And that is, I play the soprano. Phrase one with the minor sixth. Here's phrase two. Flatting the E flat makes it a major sixth. Phrase three. Minor seventh. What would you do next? Would you do this? Do you see what I mean? He's exploring. He's trying this, he's trying that, he's trying this and that. And you want to feel it that way, you want to play it that way. At least I do when I play this piece. You're having to build up here. This is like going into winter hibernation emotionally to fuel up and gear up for what's coming. The base of these eight measures starts, like I said, just like measure one, exploring the tonality of the scale with the long, short, long, rhythmic motive. Let's take a look now at these eight measures, what the bass does. Because every two measures, we're going to a new key. But it's so subtle, you don't really even know what's in there. Make it kind of spooky. Not too real. Here's the oh, gorgeous. It's an A flat major inversion. Alto is providing what I think is, is the miracle of this whole section. Again, with the two, three, one, two, three, one, da 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 Listen to these harmonies. This is absolutely... I'm going to go slowly.
that's beautiful by itself. But with the soprano, the whole thing becomes complete. So let me now play as written with all the parts. And I like to stroke the keys a little bit. This is hard to control. But if you think of your fingers always pliable like clay, your fingers and the, the keys kind of become a whole uh, composition, a whole sculpture within itself. And getting to know your hands and your pliability is a huge part of playing the piano and getting the results that you want. And it takes a lot of practice to get to know your hand and how to work it. I really think of, of my fingers as clay and alive. And that's why your hands have to be warm. If they're cold, they don't work. The nerve endings just aren't there. You don't have the tactile control. All the parts now. Asking the question. which is creating energy. He's changing the meter from a 9-8 into a 12-8 here. Now that 12-8 to 6-8, that's that same idea as the hemiola on the previous page. It's taking what would be nine beats and nine beats, but giving three of those to the first measure, so it's 12, and taking away three from the second measure, so it's six. It's important to know that. In my music, actually, I circle. I love using color. I think you see that I use color all the time. It's powerful. I circled the 12-8 and the 6-8 here because I don't want to miss it, and when I learn the piece, I count this out loud. It changes it knowing where those beats are and knowing why is he doing it? He's doing it to create the tension. So let's put the hands together now. We are about at the defining moment of the piece where these bells come in. I just, I'm so excited. I can hardly wait to get there. Starts pianissimo. Right. 
right hand is taking this beautiful texture of, of a ec ecstatic, listen to these notes. <laughs> combined moment, the tochka of the piece, the point, the defining point of the piece, and Rachmaninoff knew he was getting to this point. He wrote the entire piece with this in, in mind. It was like a searchlight at the end there saying, come to me, this is where we're going, and here it is. <laughs> Blended layout. One, two, three, four, five measures. System two, one, two, three, four. And meter changes. 12, 8, 9, 8 to Anne with your retard. 12, 8 for two. And 9, 8 for two. That's important. Now, down in here, I wanted to show you that he uses that interval of the falling sixth overlapping. And I'm going to redistribute the tenor. Uh, the left hand part, it goes like this. Six, six. So he's using double sixths for system two. It helps to know that that's in there. One last view of the satellite view. And I put that in the yellow the top of page four with the bells, the arriving tochka of the piece, that's a word Rachmaninoff used, was so blazingly brilliant and exhilarating and uh, euphoric, really. Uh, exultation, that's the word. Uh, you know, the religious fervor, uh, you know, just um, being caught up with uh, dazzling, almost blinding. I and mean, that's what the church bells do in the stained glass window. All of that, I had my own childhood experiences of that, which have stayed with me my entire life, of something that moves me profoundly. And that's what this yellow box is. But now we're coming down. He's bringing us down. Remember we had the six, way down here. Bringing you down to the coda. This is where we are now. I'm gonna use our working copy to show you the remaining nine measures of the piece, he's going to give us a spectacular surprise. Right here we have... One last. And that's how the piece... Do you see how it's completely coming full circle from where it started? Completely. Right here at the coda here, measure 50, with this sixth. Now what he's giving us is a, another repetition of scale degree outline in the most splendid descending A major scale. Listen to this bass part. I'm here on this E. Would you believe he's going to go to the very bottom A of the keyboard in the scale of A major. Who's going to think of that and who's going to make it sound this magical? And there's a long chord here. Listen to the counts here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Take. 
and the soprano, right hand. Isn't that amazing? He starts with this and ends up here. Let's put it all together so you can see. There's one more surprise I'm saving for the very end. Last line, Coda. So he saved the last for a combined descent and ascent, the only time in the piece he does that. So I have really enjoyed sharing this piece with you. Believe it or not, this was the very first prelude that I learned from the Opus 32. I learned it 20 years ago. I was just so drawn to this piece. It just spoke to me so deeply. So I've come to know it uh, as I would a very deep friendship and it continues to surprise me and overwhelm me with its beauty and its magnificence. So I hope this has been helpful for you and I hope you play this. It will be well worth the work. Thank you so much.